creatures. Well, I will die at all. Be your light to win. Bring it home. Don't let me be your shelter. Never leave you all alone. I can be the one you call when you want to run. Don't let me be your fortress.
All right, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Metro North Church. Would y'all stand and uh, put your hands together and sing along with us? Come set your rule and reign in our hearts again. Increase in us, we pray. Unveil why we're made. Come set our hearts ablaze with hope. Like wildfire in our very souls, Holy Spirit, come invade us now. We are your church, and we need your power in us. We seek your kingdom first. We hunger and we thirst. Yeah, there you go. online also. Uh, if you want to say good morning back, please don't forget to text Matt Swartz. He's taken all those texts. He'll answer everyone personally. Just kidding. But uh, Anyway, welcome to our guest. Uh, I'm, I'm always cutting up and acting up, so I apologize in advance. But um, if you'll open your bulletin, you'll find a card in there called a Connect card. It's a very useful card, and it accomplishes several things for you and us. 
Uh, the first thing on the connect side, you can give us a record of your visit. Let us know that you were here. We, we find that helpful knowing who's coming into our, our group and visiting with us. The other thing you can do with the connect card side is let us know if there's something you're interested in. If there's something that you would like, you have a skill or a gift that you would like to uh, participate in uh, at Metro North, uh, very useful and let us know and we can get back with you on any questions you might have about that. On the flip side, uh, it's probably the more important side for me and that's the prayer side. So if you have any prayer requests or anything that you just are burdened about in your life or some other people you know that you want prayer or you're witnessing to somebody and you say, I'll have my church pray for this, it's a great place to put those prayers down. And people actually pray for this. We have a whole group that does it. And this goes to the elders and the officers of the church. And, and we pray for, for the needs of the people also. So very important cards. Please please fill those out. So we've already said welcome to our online members, but uh, we'd like for you to subscribe also. It helps with the ratings on YouTube and makes us easier to find for people that uh, are looking for us. So please do that. Our vision here is to create a church together that connects people to the transforming grace of God. And one way we do that is through good, solid preaching and teaching. So worship today really is about how in the middle of life's difficulties that God is with us, speaking truth to us and calling us to obedience in, in himself. In other words, it's really about concerning doubt. And it'll be the first of three sermons in, in Gideon or about Gideon in the book of Judges. So. Uh, really looking forward to that myself and hearing that because I have a lot of doubt. I'm a big mouth. I come off as confidence, but I actually do have a lot of doubt and I struggle with that. So I look forward to that. Our call to worship today comes from Psalm chapter 59, verses 16 and 17. But I will sing of your strength. I will sing aloud of your steadfast love in the morning. For you have been to me a fortress and a refuge in the day of my distress. O oh, my strength, I will sing praises to you. For you, O oh God, are my fortress, the God who shows me steadfast love. Let's pray. Father, there's no need to invite you here. And no need to invite your spirit here, but because you're already here. And, uh, but we do ask that you would be present with us in, in almost a tangible way, that, uh, Lord, that we would join in worship, that you would fill our hearts and flood us with your spirit, with, with the joy of worshiping uh, such a great God who has done so much for us and who loves us and cares for us, that you would fill our mouths with song, Lord, uh, that we may praise you and worship you, that you would make our, our hearts giving, not just giving of money, but giving of, of, of ourselves to the cause of Christ. And Father, that you would make our ears and our hearts attentive to your word today as it's preached, that uh, you, by your power, your spirit, would grant us that so that we may worship you and praise you and honor you as we ought to do. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. And would you all stand, um, stand with us as we continue to sing?
slightly different arrangement this morning. What? Don't do it yet. <laughs> yeah. Uh, if you've been visiting Metro North for any time, you know that we're a confessional church. And what that really means is that we confess our sins to God. We confess our sins to one another. We also confess what we believe. And this morning is one of those times where we're going to be confessing what we believe. And our confession is going to come from a thing called the Heidelberg Catechism. Now, there are things, sometimes it's confusing for people because there are confessions. There's a Westminster Confession, the Westminster or the Heidelberg Confession, and then there's Westminster Catechisms and Heidelberg Catechisms. So a confession is a summary, big summary of what's in the Scripture. The catechisms are little broken down snippets of what those points of theology are. So that's what we're doing this morning. We're confessing a point of theology what we believe, and it comes from the Heidelberg Catechism. So I'm going to ask a question, I'll ask the question, and then we'll all read together what the answer is. And this is from the Heidelberg Catechism. Christian, what is your only comfort in life and death? That I am not my own, but belong body and soul in life and in death to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. He has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood and has set me free from the tyranny of the devil. He also watches over me in such a way that not a hair can fall from my head without the will of my Father in heaven. In fact, all things must work together for my salvation. Because I belong to him, Christ, by his Holy Spirit, assures me of eternal life and makes me wholeheartedly willing and ready from now on to live for him. Amen. You may be seated. At this time, John, would you come forward? We're going to have some of the testimonies from some of our mission trips, and then John, you'll pray for us afterward. I'd like to invite the missions team to come up here. Come all the way up here on the stage so everybody can see you. Getting a lot of feedback up here. Ten people uh, go to Imperial, Pennsylvania. And then uh, my daughter, the redhead there on the end, also served at work camps but served in Indiana. So you guys need to move down this way, closer to the mic. Guess who gets to go first? The first one who's willing to speak, not you. you got, I just wanted to make you see you sweat there for a minute. <laughs> so who wants to tell me? Uh, so this team went to Imperial, Pennsylvania, which is right outside of Pittsburgh. Who wants to tell me what you guys did? What work did you do there? So we were separated into two different crews. So one of our crews, we pressure washed and painted a porch, well stained it, and we had some iron railing on the back that we wire brushed and spray painted, and then, oh uh, yeah, we had, we had to break down cement in her front yard on her sidewalk and mix and pour. By hand? Cement. Yeah. With sledgehammer? Yeah. Did you do that? Yeah. Oh, you're so awesome. I did. Who we got to did. do this spray wash? Me and right. Robert pressure wash the front porch. Good job, Robert. Get and to Mr. do Kenny. power tools you don't ever get to use. Anything else you did? Tell me about your residence. Who wants to tell me about your residence? Just a little bit about the people, who they were. So I was on a different crew, and I had a nice lady named Miss Barb, and she made us cookies and <laughs> gave us water bottles, and she talked to us like genuinely was interested in what we were doing and why we were there and she really liked having the company and she had really cool dogs. Yeah, so some of the work that we did at her house, we had to paint her entire trailer, the trim. Um, she had a large shed that we had to, to paint um, and this was all after we had to clean and pressure wash um, the trailer. And then we um, updated the front porch, we added um, a new um, coat of paint and um, 
Nick and Gemma built a new set of uh, steps for the front porch. And then on the very last day, um, this was really neat. Um, so Kenny's crew, um, which involved Robert, Brenna, Marissa, and Jolie, um, they finished up early. So they actually came over and helped us build an entire back porch. Um, and we finished with just a little bit of time to spare um, to, to go back to camp, so. Okay, pass it to Stephanie. Uh, Stephanie served in Westfall? Westfield. Westfield, Indi Indiana, which is just north of Indianapolis. And what did you do there? Um, so I was actually working as a program team member. So what I got to do was go around to all the different camp sites, to work sites, and um, take pictures of the different crews and get to talk with the crews and see what they were doing and then help out with the morning and evening services. But a couple of cool God sightings that we had during the week. Um, this year was a little different for group work camps because typically all the churches get split up in different crews, but you hear like from them, they were all together. Um, but we had one church who has a quilting club back at their church and the women in the, in the quilting club make a quilt for every single camper who is going so that they can give it to their resident. But because they were all together, they had 26 people going and they had 26 quilts that would only go to two residents. And so they talked to our, re to our director of the camp and we actually had 26 residents throughout the camp. And so um, they got to distribute the quilts to all the different people in Westfield. Um, and then another cool God sighting that I wanted to share is this particular site that me and my friend got to visit a couple times um, was a grandma and during the day she watched um, her two kids, her two grandkids. And this little girl is probably maybe three years old, um, and she was asking her grandma questions about, like, why are these people here? Why are they helping us rebuild our back porch? Um, and the grandma's like, well, they're here because they love Jesus, and they're, they actually paid to come here, and they're not getting paid. And the little girl said, oh, no, they're getting paid in Jesus dollars. <laughs> how, how about the group from Imperial? What are some of your God sightings? How do you see God do something unique, something interesting during that time? All right, put down your hands. Not everybody at once. What does something God do? It could be on the trip up, the trip back, anything. Um, I have two. Is that okay? That's fine. Okay, so the first one, if any of y'all have ever been to work camp, you know you get put into crews with strangers, not usually your youth group. So we were kind of worried about that. We were going to spend a whole week within crews with our youth group, people we already knew. So we figured maybe we'll get annoyed with each other or something. But we actually all, well, my crew, obviously, I got to grow with, more with them and know them better just other than seeing them on Sundays and Wednesdays, which was kind of cool. And then my other God sighting is my resident. In the past, my residents are usually thankful. Like on the last day, they'll be like, okay, cool, thank you. But our resident, she was out there every day, her and her son, all day in the heat, the cold, the rain. And they were out there with us offering to help. And our guy had every single tool we needed because we forgot to get tools. And so he had wheelbarrow, everything, and cool. shovels. So it was pretty cool. That's cool. Yeah, usually the people that they serve are either elderly or uh, physically unable to do a lot of the work. So it's just a wonderful opportunity for them to go. Now, I want to encourage you. There's a lot more stories than we have time to share. So talk to these folks. They all have individual things that they learned, that God taught them about themselves, ways that they were changed, but also uh, ways they saw God at work. So ask them those things. They would be, be thrilled to talk about that. But thank you all, and thank you all for supporting them. Let's give them a big hand. If you would, please join me now as we pray. Gracious Father, we come before you today and we want to thank you, first of all, that here we are celebrating 245 years of being a nation. And Father, we're grateful for the way that you have blessed the United States of America. And we're thankful that we are able to live in a country such as this that uh, is very prosperous, that has much wealth, education, good schools, good health care. And yet, Father, we know that even with all these gifts that you call us to live in a new way, that because we have been giving much, much is required from us. Father, help us to be a, not just a church, but a people, a nation that serves the world, 
out of our abundance. You have blessed us, Father, but it's not just so that we can enjoy, but that we can serve. Help us to be a nation. Help our church, specifically Metro North, to be a church that serves this community, that meets people's needs where they are, albeit big or small, Father, that we are able to give over and above because you are working through us. Father, we pray that you would make us a light here in this community, that as you draw people to yourself, you would bring them in relationship with us, that we might earn the right to be heard, that we might share the gospel, the good news of what Jesus Christ has done for us. Father, we pray that you would stir up their hearts, grant them the gift of faith that they might believe. Father, convict our hearts. Don't make us comfortable. Comfortable to just live a nice, quiet, peaceful life, Father. Help us to be engaged in building your kingdom. Help us to be engaged in making disciples of men, women, boys, and girls. Father, we pray for those who are serving abroad in our military that you would be with them during this time, that they would have a deep sense of your presence to comfort, protect them. Father, we ask for those who are here in our church that are struggling financially, that are struggling relationally, Father, that are suffering in in many number of ways, that you would comfort them, that you would be with them. Give them a deep sense of your presence, that they are not alone. Father, we thank you, and we are grateful. And we pray that you would, once again, stir up in us a heart to love the lost, to serve those who have less than us, that you might be glorified. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, some of you may be noticing that we're working to get back to a more normal footing here at Metro, and uh, one of those things today will be the offering. So um, just to remind you, there should be a slide up here behind me. There are several ways you can give by Scrabble, as you, as you notice there. But no, uh, you can give online, you can give via mail, you can give by text, and this morning we'll be passing the plate. Uh, like normal. Now, we don't do this so that we're forcing you to give or anything, but the elders feel that it's, it's a commandment of Scripture that we give and that we support God's work and that the Bible teaches that. So we put that before the people in a physical fashion by passing the plate. So as I said, there's several ways to give. Our offertory scripture comes from Proverbs chapter 22, verse 9. He who is generous will be blessed. For he gives some of his food to the poor. And I'll ask the deacons now to come forward. Thank you, brothers. We're also going to do something else a little different this morning. We're going to, we've been doing this a few Sundays now. We're going to stand up and greet one another. But before we do, I'd like to remind you that some people are still sensitive to uh, shaking hands and things like that. And those of you who may be sensitive to shaking hands, don't feel bad or put out if you, everyone will work to be sensitive to that. But feel free now to get up and to greet one another in the name of the Lord, the living God. church. 
Okay, I've given you guys a little extra time this morning because I know you haven't got to do much of that. By the way, for you online folks, I checked with Matt. He did not get a single text, so feel free to flood him with that. Uh, before John comes and preaches, I would like to invite your attention to several more announcements here. You'll find these on the back of your bulletin or online. Um, or I'll announce them here and they'll be on slides above me. But if you're interested in joining Metro North Church, uh, we have a Connect class on Friday, Friday, July 23rd from 7 to 9 p.m. Child care will be provided and you can scan the QR code, sign up online uh, and or note in your Connect card even if you want and, and put that in the box in the back. Another important note is VBS, VBS, Vacation Bible School, will be on July 17th. Here, uh, there are two sessions, morning and afternoon sessions. So scan the QR code there and sign up online. I need to emphasize this, space is limited. Space is limited. No walk-ons for the team this year. Okay, so space, space is limited. We, we won't turn anybody away. But space is limited, and kids must be pre-registered. That way we make sure we have enough uh, stuff for the, for the kids and everything's covered. So please pre-register and realize that space is limited. Volunteers are needed. Volunteers are needed. And there'll be training for those volunteers on 11 July. Training on 11 July at 0930. That's 930 a.m. for you civilians. Okay, so 930 on July 11. And then last of all, parents of kids going to TVR, parents of kids going to TVR, there's a TVR parent meeting July 7th at 6 p.m. All forms are due. So all this information's available online, and I think most of it is going to be on the back of your, your bulletins also. So without further ado, John, please come break the bread of life. Thank you all for being here this morning. It's, it's good to be back. I mean, it's nice to go and see family, but uh, when you got a family like mine, it's, it's a little strange and weird. It's always good to get back to the strange and weird folks I know here. Can't hear me at all, right? Well, it's not me. It's on. It's not muted. It's coming through. Better? All right. I'll do the best I can. Can you hear me now? All right. Well, we are continuing in our, our study of uh, Judges. We're on chapter 6. Uh, the series is called Glimpses of Grace. And uh, there was a little boy that had a part in a school play, and he had one line to deliver. And his line was this, It is I, be not afraid. Okay? And he practiced it, practiced it. But when the time came, he actually got up on stage and he announced, it's me and I'm scared. <laughs> and that is pretty much the story of Gideon. Gideon, as much as, as we'd like to you know, make him a hero, he was a scaredy cat. In fact, I've entitled this, this sermon, Mighty Reluctant Warriors. Because that's what you and I are. God calls us mighty warriors. 
when we do what He says, when we live in obedience to Him. But we're often very reluctant. We're very scared. Remember the cycle of judges that we've been going through. Each judge kind of passes through this same cycle. There's a time of disobedience. And as the people disobey, God allows oppression to come in. He calls a a judge to come and deliver the people. And then after that time of deliverance, there's a time of peace. Chapter 5, verse 31, ends with this. This is the story after after, uh, Deborah brought the great victory we learned about last week. It says this in chapter 5, verse 31, And the land had rest for 40 years. There's 40 years of peace. But then what happened? Well, chapter 6, verse 1 begins with this. The people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord gave them into the hand of Midian seven years. So disobedience through idol worship and the subsequent oppression from the Midianites occurs in just a 40-year time span. A 40-year time span. 40 years. That's the same amount of time that the, the children of Israel wandered in the desert to let a whole disobedient generation die off. Well, the next three weeks, we're going to take a look at this one judge named Gideon. And what did God do? And that's the important thing you need to see, how God worked through this man. So if you would for the uh, if you would stand now for the reading of God's word, we're going to read Judges chapter 6. So if you're able, please stand. This is the word of God. The people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord gave them into the hand of Midian 7 years. And the hand of Midian overpowered Israel, and because of Midian, the people of Israel made for themselves the dens that are in the mountains and the caves and the strongholds. For whenever the Israelites planted crops, the Midianites and the Amalekites and the people of the east would come up against them. They would encamp against them and devour the produce of the land as far as Gaza and leave no sustenance in Israel and no sheep or ox or donkey. For they would come up with their livestock and their tents and they would, make, uh, and they would come like locusts in number. Both they and their camels could not be counted, so that they laid waste the land as they came in. And Israel was brought very low because of Midian, and the people of Israel cried out for help to the Lord. When the people of Israel cried out uh, to the Lord on account of the Midianites, the Lord sent a prophet to the people of Israel. And he said to them, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I led you up from Egypt and brought you out of the house of bondage and I delivered you from the hand of the Egyptians and from the hand of all who oppressed you and drove them out before you and gave you their land and I said to you I am the God uh, I am the Lord your God you shall not fear the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell but you have not obeyed my voice now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth at Orpah which belonged to Joash, the Abbey Ezrite, while his son Gideon was beating out wheat in the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, The Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. And Gideon said to him, Please, sir, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And where are all his wonderful deeds that our fathers recounted to us, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? And now the Lord has forsaken us and given us into the hand of Midian. And the Lord turned to him and said, Go in this might of yours and save Israel from the hand of Midian. Do I not send you? And he said to him, Please, Lord, how can I save Israel? Behold, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. And the Lord said to him, But I will be with you, and you shall strike the Midianites as one man. And he said to him, If now I have found favor in your eyes, then show me a sign that it is you who speaks with me. Please do not depart from here until I come to you and bring my present and set it before you. And he said, I will stay till you return. So Gideon went into his house and prepared a young goat and unleavened cakes from an ephah of flour. The meat he put in a basket, and the broth he put in a pot, and he brought them to him under the terebinth and presented them. 
And the angel of the Lord said to him, Take the meat and the unleavened cakes and put them on this rock and pour the broth over them. And he did so. Then the angel of the Lord reached out the tip of the staff that was in his hand and touched the meat and the unleavened cakes. And fire sprang from the rock and consumed the flesh and the unleavened cakes. And the angel of the Lord vanished from his sight. Then Gideon perceived that he was the angel of the Lord. And Gideon said, Alas, O Lord, for now I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. But the Lord said to him, Peace be to you. Do not fear. You shall not die. Then Gideon built an altar there to the Lord and called it, The Lord is Peace. To this day it stands in Orpah, which belongs to the Abiezrites. That night the Lord said to him, Take your father's bull and the second bull, seven years old, and pull down the altar of Baal that your father has, and cut down the Asherah that is beside it, and build an altar to the Lord your God on the top of the stronghold here, with stones laid out in due order. Then take the second bull, an offering as a burnt offering, with the wood of the Asherah and that you shall cut down. So Gideon took ten men of his servants and did as the Lord has told him. But because he was too afraid of his family and the men of the town to do it by day, he did it by night. When the men of the town rose early in the morning, behold, the altar of Baal was broken down and the Asherah beside it was cut down. And the second bull was offered on the altar that had been built. And they said to one another, Who has done this thing? And after they had searched and inquired, they said, Gideon, the son of Joash, has done this thing. Then the men of the town said to Joash, Bring out your son that he may die, for he has broken down the altar of Baal and cut down the Asherah beside it. Now Joash said to all who stood against him, Will you contend for Baal, or will you save him? Whoever contends for him shall be put to death by morning, for he, if he is God, let him contend for himself, because his altar has been broken down. Therefore on that day Gideon was called Jerubal, that is to say, let Baal contend against him, because he broke down his altar." Now all the Midianites and the Amalekites and the people of the east came together, and they crossed the Jordan and encamped in the valley of Jezreel. But the Spirit of the Lord clothed Gideon, and he sounded the trumpet, and the Abiezrites called uh, out to follow him. And he sent messengers throughout all Manasseh, and they too called out to follow him. And he sent messengers to Asher, Zebulun, and Naphtali, and they went up to meet them. Then Gideon said to God, if you will save Israel by my hand, as you have said, behold, I am laying a fleece of wool on the threshing floor. If there is dew on the fleece alone, and it is dry on the ground, then I shall know that you will save Israel by my hand, as you have said. And it was so. When he rose early the next morning and squeezed the fleece, he wrung enough dew from the fleece to fill a bowl with water. Then Gideon said to God, let not your anger burn against me. Let me speak just once more. Please let me test just once more with the fleece. Please let it be dry on the fleece only and all the ground let there be dew. And God did so that night. And it was dry on the fleece only and all the ground there was dew. Let's pray. Father, these are stories from another time. Stories that seem strange and weird where God appears. He talks to regular folks. They're scared, they're worried, they don't know what to do. Much like us, Father, we get distracted, we get worried in life. But you still speak through your word, even stories that are centuries old. We pray now that your spirit would come, as only your spirit can. Divide our hearts, go to the very core of those things that we need to know. We ask you to speak now by your spirit to us. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. All right, you may be seated. First thing I want you to see from this passage, it's something you know, but we need to be reminded, God speaks the truth. God always speaks the truth. Verse 1, it says, The people did what was evil. The Lord gave them into the hand of Midian. Israel made for themselves the dens that are in the mountains and the caves and the strongholds. Things were so bad... This is the worst impression, uh, oppression that we've seen yet in Israel. And it's so extreme that they're forced to retreat up into the hills and live in caves and holes. The Midianites and the Amalekites were not interested in controlling the land. 
they were in, interested in plundering the people. They want, didn't want to occupy the land. They just wanted to come and take their stuff and retreat. They exploit Israel economically, taking their crops, their very animals, which they needed to sustain life. Verse 4, they would encamp against them, devour the produce of the land, and leave no sustenance in Israel. So the people retreated up into the hills just to protect what little they had. So the Midianites laid waste to the land as they came in. Israel cries out to the Lord. We expect Him to raise up a a judge and bring deliverance. But what does He do? Instead of bringing deliverance, He brings them a sermon. Verse 6, Israel was brought low. The people cried out. And when the people cried out, verse 8, the Lord sent a prophet. You know, a lot of times we want deliverance, and yet God constantly wants to drive us back to His Word to tell us what is already true. We've just forgotten it, right? So the prophet comes and he says, thus says the Lord. He's speaking for God. And he says, look, I led you. I delivered you. I drove them out. I gave you their land. And yet you have not obeyed my voice. Before the Israelites can appreciate their rescue, they need to understand why they need rescuing. A lot of times we're like that. We just want things to go back to normal. And we don't realize the very circumstance that we're in is God's trying to drive something home. It's kind of like Him saying, wake up. Pay attention here. You've missed something. The prophet reminds them of their sin here. But Israel's crying out to the Lord, and it's important you see this, is not true repentance. They're not crying out for repentance. They're crying out for things to go back in a good way for them, for some kind of deliverance. It's not true repentance. It's only superficial. You see, the people are regretful, but they're not repentant. 2 Corinthians 7, verse 10 says this, For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. Both repentance and regret can be characterized with deep sorrow and distress, but they're very different. Very different. So repentance or regret, what's the difference? Well, let me be very frank. We are often regretful, but we're not often repentant. What's the difference between the two? Well, first of all, regret does not bring real change. Repentance does. Regret is sorry for the consequences of the sin. Why are the Midianites taking our stuff? God, you've got to fix this. But they're not, they're not repentant. They're not frustrated by the fact that they have disobeyed God. See, as soon as the circumstances would go away, the people would go right back to sinning. Their sinful behavior would return. So first of all, regret does not bring real change. Repentance does. Secondly, worldly sorrow stays regretful, while repentance focuses on the real result of the sin, the disruption in our relationship with the Lord and violating His commands. That's what repentance is. Regret focuses on us and how we feel. Focuses on the situation. Repentance focuses on God. The fact that His glory has been diminished and we have abused His grace. God tells us the truth about ourselves. We need to tell the truth about our sin. The Lord sends this prophet to move Israel from regret to repentance. You know, we're often a a lot like Israel. We cry out to God for whatever the situation is. Maybe it's a a job problem. Maybe it's a relational problem. Just something we can't seem to fix. And we cry out to God, and we want God to fix it. But did you notice that there's no repentance here on the part of Israel? There's no repentance. There's no tearing down of the altar other than what Gideon did. There's no... 
national, on a national level, the, the burning of the Asherah poles. There's no, there's no repentance on the part of the people. There's no humbling of themselves. And yet God, in His grace, still calls His judge. You know, Romans 5.8 5, tells us this, God shows His love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That's a wonderful picture of the gospel. God doesn't come to you and go, hey man, you need to clean up your act. You clean up your act, then I'll come and save you. No, God comes, and by the fact that we're even cleaning up our act is evidence that God's at work. Because left to ourselves, we wouldn't. God shows grace for us in that He acts on our behalf while we're still sinners. That, that ought to stir up your heart in gratefulness and thankfulness that all... God, thank you that you work in me in spite of myself. We need to remember God's saving actions in our lives. Look at verse 8. So the Lord sends a prophet, and he says to them, thus says the Lord. Look at what God did. He says, look, I led you. I delivered you. I drove them out. I gave you their land. I led you. I delivered them. I drove them out. I gave you. These actions are what builds our faith today so that we'll continue to trust in the Lord. You've got to remember those things that God has done in the past are there to help drive you in the future. I got to go up to Indiana to spend time with family. And one of my family members is a, a cousin named Roger. When Jackie and I were living in Chicago, we would come down to Indiana like for the 4th of July because uh, my Aunt Maxine had a place on the lake. So we built a great relationship with her. Well, eventually we moved from Chicago and we moved to Orlando. And in the subsequent years, Maxine passed away. Jackie and I were young, barely have any money, but we said we need to go up there for the funeral. And we said, it's, it's too far of a drive because i got to get back for work. I said, let's, let's just bite the bullet. We'll buy a couple plane tickets and we'll go. Cost us $700 and some change for two round-way trips. So we go up there. We're at the funeral. We're spending time with family. Um, a couple of the aunts come to me and they say, listen, we found this money amongst Maxine's uh, possessions and we know you, she, you guys have, have sacrificed a lot to be here so we want to give you this it'll it'll help they gave us four hundred dollars cash and we thought well that's great god you know it cost us 700 and change but we'll, we'll take 400 that's better than nothing right so we go to the funeral that's all done we fly back home we go to check our mail there are two checks two checks that equal the exact amount to total up to 700 and change that has become a marker in my life to where I can look back and say, God, I needed 700 and change. You provided 700 and change. Next week, if I need 10,000, God, you can provide 10,000 and change. Whatever I need. God works in your life in the here and now and in the past to drive you forward in faith in the future. Even Gideon here understood that. God rescued the people from Egypt but he missed the part of God's going to rescue us today. When difficult circumstances come in your life, it should drive us back to God's Word. God speaks the truth to us, using His Word to teach us about Himself, His goodness, His faithfulness, His glory. Now, even though there's no sign of repentance on the part of Israel, we see a glimpse of God's grace and that He still calls His deliverer. The second thing I want you to see is that God is with us in our distress. So the angel of the Lord comes. Verse 12, the angel of the Lord appears to him and it says, The Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. Now, this is almost comical, right? He's hiding in a hole to keep his little measly bit of wheat, or cornmeal, whatever he's got, from the people that are coming to plunder. So here's this guy hiding in a hole, and God comes, hey, mighty men of valor. And I, I, you know, I have a sarcastic wit. I apologize. I read the Bible that way sometimes. Maybe I shouldn't. But Gideon responds in verse 13. And, and I hear sarcasm. I hear, 
please, sir. Like, are you kidding me? That may not be the way he said it, but that's what I hear. But looks at, listen to him. If the Lord's with us, then why has all this happened? Where's all his wonderful deeds? The Lord has forsaken us and given us into the hand of Midian. He's already given up. Now, you need to understand here, the Lord here is actually, uh, the, the angel of the Lord here is actually the Lord here. Let me tell you a little thing I've learned that will help you to understand that. The, this manifestation of God is the Lord because he's worshipped. He accepts this offering that he brings. Other places where a true angel appears and people bow down to worship him, what does the angel always say? Get up. Don't worship me. Here he accepts that, right? It's just the wording that the, the author is using here. So anyway, God's coming. He's declaring to Gideon. He's a mighty man of valor. Now you have to understand that Gideon is mighty not because of anything he's done, but because of the Lord. The Lord is the one who is with him. The Lord is the one who, who gives Gideon his abilities, his strength. But we often make the same mistake that Gideon did. We assume that our difficulties, the tough times I'm going through right now, I lost my job, I'm having this relationship problem, I can't seem to fix this. What do we say? What did I do, God? Why are you punishing me? That's the way we look at the world, right? Much like Gideon. God, why are you allowing the Midianites to come down? It's not fair. We assume that God has abandoned us. Gideon here in verse 13 says, If the Lord is with, with us, then why has all this happened? Instead, the Lord is working through those very circumstances you're going through for your good. We often wait for God to act. We wait for Him to do something. We wait for someone else to come and help. We say, Lord, why don't you remove this problem? Rather than saying, Lord, okay, I'm in this. You've given me the grace to handle this in this moment. Give me the strength. Give me the ability to persevere and to glorify you in the midst of this situation. That's what we need to be saying. Because God is using those very circumstances to drive us back to him. So God comes to Gideon. He tells Gideon to save Israel. But again, Gideon is reluctant. Verse 14, the Lord turns to him and says, Go in this might of yours to save Israel. Do not I send you? In other words, he's saying, look, it's me. I'm sending you. That should, that should settle it right there. But what does Gideon say? Well, how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh. I am the least in my father's house. Now remember, in a few verses later, he gets ten servants to help him. That doesn't sound to me like the least family in all of Manasseh. They've got some pretty good wealth there. They had their own altar on a stronghold that his father had. It was well known. Probably the whole town worshipped Baal there at different times. But God says, I will be with you, and you shall strike the Midianites as one man. Gideon's excuses reveal his lack of of trust in God's power, in God's presence. God calls Gideon a mighty warrior. And he is to use this power that God has given him. He says, go in this might of yours. But see, Gideon does not yet understand that Yahweh's work, that God's work does not depend on his social standing, how important his family is or not. But as he goes, as he uses his ability, as he remembers that God is with him, that's when God works. God, again, reassures Gideon by telling him he's not alone. That he has chosen Gideon for this task to be his vehicle of salvation. The Lord says to him, I will be with you and you shall strike the Midianites as one man. That's his way of saying that the, the, uh, as one man, it's the, the, the victory is guaranteed. But Gideon is still reluctant. He asks for a sign. And the Lord burns up his offering. And this brings him some measure of peace. But right now, what's worrying you? I mean, you're here today. 
But everybody in here, and I know everyone in here has something that's weighing on their mind. What has you worried? What has you concerned right now? What are you fearful of? Why are you anxious? When I have those feelings, those thoughts, those things that tend to capture my mind, I have to constantly remind myself of what I know to be true. And I've discovered, especially this summer, it's interesting, I've, I've reminded myself of three things. God is in control. I know that here sometimes, but I don't know it here. But I have to remind myself, is God in control? He absolutely, he controls everything. I think Abraham Kuyper is the guy that said, not one atom is out of place. Not one atom is outside of God's control. So everything that happens in the world, God is in control of. So that, that encourages my heart. Does God love me? Absolutely. His word tells me so. And I have to remind myself, does God have John's best interest in mind? He does. And then, and this is most important to me, is God with me? Yeah. He hasn't abandoned me. Oh, I may feel alone. And I often do, but God's with me. Well, even after the Lord's continual encouragement to Gideon, Gideon still remains reluctant. And we need to see, even though when we disobey like that, even when we don't trust in God, God is with us in our disobedience. God doesn't abandon Gideon, even though he reluctantly obeys. Gideon struggles to obey, even though God has clearly spoken. I mean, think about it. Let's say, let's say you're hiding in your garage because you don't want the neighbors to see what's going on. And the God appears to you, the angel of the Lord, and he has, I have this task for you. I want you to do this. And you're like, yeah, is that really you, God? I just don't know if it's you. Well, I tell you what, let me go get an offering for you. And then you go get the offering, you bring it back. God miraculously sets this thing on fire and consumes it. And you're still going, yeah, but is that really you, God? I mean, that's what's going on here, right? Isn't that the way we are? You know, we ask God, we say, uh, I remember doing this, I'm, I'm dumb like this. I would say, God, if, if Jackie is the girl to marry, this, as I'm driving down the road here, this next billboard, let me see her name. And you turn the corner and it says, Harold Johnson's Insurance. And I'm like, okay, God didn't ask me to marry a girl named Harold. But, you know, we, we look for those kind of things, right? Those kind of directions from God. Verse 24, Gideon builds an altar there to the Lord, and he called it the Lord is peace. So he's getting some measure of peace from God. But God tells him he needs to destroy the altar uh, of this false God. So verse 27, he takes ten men of his servants and did as the Lord had told him. But because he was too afraid of his family and the men of the town to do it by day, he did it by night. Gideon builds an altar to the true God, and he tears down the altar of this false God. But did you notice how bad things have gotten, how disobedient the people are? Gideon is more afraid of his family than he is of God. He's more afraid of the people in the town than he is of obeying God. His father, Joash, had even built an altar to Baal in the backyard. The people want to come and kill Gideon. The people eventually, I mean, just the fact that they want to kill one of their own because he tore down the altar of their false god, you know, we could speak a whole sermon on that. But then they mock him. They call him Jerubal, which means let, god, let Baal contend against him. In other words, Baal's going to get you is what they change his name to. You wait and see. Baal's going to get you. So that's how far their hearts had gone away from the true God. Joash's father had clearly taught his children something about God. He taught them something about the Exodus and the Lord's rescue. But here he is also serving Baal. Many of the Israelites had at this point in time combined their worship of God with their worship of idols. They were called... What we, the term we use is their syncret, syncret, syncret. They, they mix religions. Let's just use that word. I can't say it. 
So they're mixing their religion, right? They may have worshipped God formally, but their lives revolved around the worship of idols, the idols of agriculture, commerce, fertility. Now let me be so bold to step on your toes for a minute. You're here today, and I'm grateful you're here today. You're worshiping the true God formally, right? But all of us, including me, we have idols that we serve. Oh, I went to church on Sunday. Yeah, I heard a great sermon by John, but, you know, it's Monday now, and this is what I'm doing. This is where my heart's at on Monday. Michael Wilcock pastor speaking about us today says this the gods have not changed for human nature has not changed and these are the gods that humanity regularly creates for itself see if you see yourself here security if you're one of those people that you've got to have it your way your way is the right way everybody else is wrong and the world's got to be ordered the way you want it you have the idol of security Comfort. Well, I would serve and do that, but, uh, you know, I, I just don't really like, you know, I don't like dealing with VBS. I, I'm just not, the, I'm not good with kids. I like my comfort. Reasonable enjoyment. Power. There's another control one. I want it my way, and if the world was done my way, it would be better, right? Because everybody knows my way is the best way. If you think like that, you have an idol of control, of power. And then, of course, wealth. He goes on to say, In every age, there are forces at work which promise to meet our desires, all having one feature in common. They promise they can make our lives better than then we can make ourselves. We say we worship the Lord, but the world has crept in and controls our heart. That's the issue. What's really controlling your heart? What controls your heart? What promise? What lie are you currently believing? Is it the idea that I, we need, I need that new job? I need that relationship. We need to move into that, that, uh, that neighborhood. If I just had that vacation, if I could get into that college, then my problems would go away. Or if I could just get out of that college, <laughs> maybe that's where you are. So what altar... As we talk about that, what altar has God, even as I speak, pressed in and said, yeah, that's it. That's the altar you built in your backyard. And you guys know it. You know it right away. I have an altar of judgment. I judge people. I don't show them grace when I need to. My wife is so good about saying, now, John, you don't know what they're going through. She mentioned this thing, you know, we know this much of people's lives. We don't know all the rest of this but I'll judge him on that minute. I'll judge him and think, I know what's right. I'm better than God. I understand him better. It's my idol. What altar has God asked you to remove from your backyard? What does your heart regularly bow down to or look for hope for, or satisfaction in? Just like God commanded Israel, he commands us to look to no one or no thing other than himself. Then we get to verse 33. All the Amalekites, the Midianites and the Amalekites, and the people of the east came together, and they crossed the Jordan, and they camped in the valley of Jezreel. Look at this map up here. Okay, this is all happening. There's Orpha. See that? That's where his hometown Right here, there's a valley. It's the Kishon River right here. This whole thing is a valley. So the people came up from here, and they've encamped here. Remember, we talked about Manasseh. He's part of Manasseh. And when he calls the other tribes, he's calling these tribes up here to come and help right there. Look at this next map. This is the map that kind of shows you the, the lay of the land. So the people have come up from the southeast, they've crossed the Jordan, and you see this valley right here? That's the valley of Jezreel. And it doesn't look like much on this map, but it's really stark. There's, it's very high mountains around it, but look at how wide and open this valley is. Show us the next one. See the mountains around? 
but it's a huge, wide, fertile valley. Why did they come up to Jezreel? Hint, hint. That's where all the stuff was. Big, fertile valley, right? If you're going to go rob the store, where do you go? To the store. So they show up. What does Gideon do? Well, first, verse 34, but the Spirit of the Lord clothed Gideon. He sounds the trumpet. The Abiezrites are called to follow him. Manasseh, Asher, Zebulun, Naphtali. Now, why would all these people rally around Gideon? I mean, his own clan, just, I don't know if it was hours or a day or two later, are calling for his execution, right? Bring him out. He messed up our altar. Let's take him down. Now they're following him. Why would they follow him? Why would all these other people follow him? Well, it's because of what it says right here. God's Spirit clothes Gideon. God's Spirit brought something about him where the people were motivated to go. And we have to understand that if anything happens good in the book of, uh, of Judges, if anything good happens to Israel, it's because of God. God brings it. The same could be true of you and I. If there's anything good in our lives, don't get to the point where you say, well, you know, I'm smart. I got myself that job. I worked hard for that. There's an arrogance there because God can take that stuff away in a heartbeat. We all know of somebody who lost it all because of whatever reason God decided to take it away. So everything good we have in life comes from God's hand. There's a humility we need to live with. God alone deserves glory for all good. So Gideon gathers the troops from his tribe, from the surrounding tribes, and yet he still remains reluctant. Now think about it from from his perspective. You're in a hole threshing wheat. This strange figure that you, I mean, you've never had the angel of the Lord come, appears to you. But all of a sudden, this is unusual. This doesn't happen every day. I'm shredding uh, shredding the wheat, but here he is. He consumes your offering. That was, I've never seen that happen before. That's a confirmation this is God. The call goes out, and all these people are coming out of the woodwork to join your army of which you're in charge. You're like, "I'm, I'm farming yesterday. Today I'm the military commander, you know. That should be a confirmation that God's at work. But still he's reluctant. He wants to know for sure. He just, you know, so what does he do? He does the whole fleece thing and the do. Now we often criticize Gideon for this. Why doesn't he just trust him? Why does he just have faith? If I was Gideon, I would have faith. But I think he simply wants the Lord to reveal his true nature. You see, Gideon had a limited experience with the Lord. He doesn't yet know that God always fulfills his word that God does what he says. Gideon didn't have a Bible. Gideon didn't have any other means of grace like baptism, like the Lord's Supper. This teaches us something today, and it's a reminder to you of something about God. He didn't have that. He didn't have Christian fellowship. He didn't have people tell him, hey, it's going to be okay. God still loves you. God's in control. Reminding you of the things you know about God. He had no previous experience with God that could teach him. But we need to understand, too, this whole idea of fleece and dew and stuff like that, this is not a story about how we get direction from God. Looking for names on billboards, looking for wet blankets or unwet blankets, that's not the way you look for God's direction in your life. Because you know why? He's given us His direction. We have his word. We have more than believers of other times have. We have God's word. And more importantly than that, we have the example of Jesus Christ. Hebrews chapter 1 says this, long ago, long ago, like in Gideon's time, right? In many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he's spoken to us by his son. We have God's word. We have the example of Jesus Christ. Gideon was asking God to reveal himself. But God graciously, patiently does it. 
He does it for us by pointing us to His Son, Jesus. We find ourselves doubting God's promises. We doubt God's presence. And we ask Him to reveal our, Himself to us again, to show us Jesus. Gideon needed this. And this is what God did. And He still does it today. Steve Sogren tells the story of a man named Joe Delaney. He was playing ball, playing catch with his son Jared on a hot summer day in Cincinnati. As they talked about Reds baseball, friends, summer vacation, the conversation took a serious turn. Joe felt like a, a backyard ball player who suddenly found himself lost in the major leagues. His son Jared says, Dad, is there a God? Joe had the same helpless feeling he experienced on the high school baseball team when he lost sight of a fly ball in the sun. Does he go forward? Does he go back? Does he stay right where he is? He just didn't know what to do, and any answer seemed wrong, so he just honestly said, Son, I don't know. I don't know if there is a God. His agnosticism failed to stifle his son's curiosity, and Jared dug a little deeper. He said, if there is a God, how would you know him? I really have no idea, Jared. I only went to church a couple times as a kid, and I, I don't know a lot about those kind of things. Jared seemed deep in thought for a few minutes as the game of catch continued. Suddenly, he headed to the house. I'll be right back, he said. I have to get something. He returned with a Mylar helium balloon that they got from the circus a few days earlier and a pin and an index card. Jared, what are you doing? His dad asked. I'm going to send a message to God, airmail. Dear God, he wrote, if you are real and if you are there, send people who know you to dad and me. Joe kept his mouth shut, not wanting to dampen his son's enthusiasm. This is silly, he thought but I hope that you're watching God. After Jared let go of the balloon, father and son stood with their faces to the sky and watched it sail away. Two days later, the writer, Steve, became part of the answer to this unusual prayer. Joe and Jared pulled into the free car wash that their church was holding as part of an outreach into the community. How much, Joe asked. It's free, no strings attached. Really? Well, why are you guys doing this? Steve said, we just want to show people God's love in a practical way. It was as if this simple statement opened a hidden door in Joe's heart. The look on his face was incredulous. Wait a minute. Are you guys Christians, he asked. Yeah, yeah, we're Christians. Are you the kind of Christians that believe in God? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we're those kind of Christians. After directing a big grin at Jared, he, Joe proceeded to tell the story of releasing the helium balloon. Now, you know me, I like telling great stories. That's a great story. But I read something this week that really disturbed me. Goose Creek probably has about 50 to 75,000 people. That's not exact, but you go online, it, it's about in that... In that, in that uh, area. How many of those people have no religious belief whatsoever? Or no religious contact? They don't go to church, any church. The Methodist church, the Catholic church, the Presbyterian church, the Baptist church, they don't go anywhere. 66%. Two out of every three people in your neighborhood, two out of every three people that you see in Walmart. Two out of every three people that you walk with in your evening walks. Two out of every three people that you're going to eat with at the restaurant in a few minutes have no religious affiliation. And they, just like you and I at one time, asked the same question. God, if you're out there, all I got is a helium balloon, but I'm asking you to show yourself to me. And guess what? God, in his grand wisdom, does it through stupid little ways like car washes, 
like VBS, like Helping Hands. Helping Hands is our, our uh, feed, feed, the, feed Those Who Don't Have Food uh, ministry. God wants to use us in this community. Just like he used Gideon. The question is, are we going to stay in the hole and shred wheat? Or are we going to do simple things and allow God to work? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your love for us. We thank you that you are a great God who does great things, even today. And you use the simple, the poor, the meager, to show yourself strong. Father, we pray that you would continue to use us as a people, use us as a church, be a light to this community, and do it through us, we ask. In Jesus' name, amen. As we come to the Lord's table, this is a a picture of God, if you will. It's a reminder that God is no longer mad at us. Have we messed up this week, this month? Absolutely. We've gone our own way. We've done our own thing. We basically said, God, I don't need you. I know better. Maybe not the whole time, but we've made those decisions. And God goes, look, I just want to let you know I'm not mad at you. I still love you. Come back. Let's restore the relationship. Let's make it right again. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 says this. Paul's talking. He says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever, therefore, eats the blood or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of profaning the body and the blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, without examining himself, eats and drinks judgment on himself. So we're going to pray, and I'm going to give you an opportunity to go before the Lord and examine your heart. Just ask the Lord, say, Lord, reveal to me those idols I have. Reveal to me where my heart strays, that I need to confess once again my dependence on you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, we do not like the quiet. The quiet feels very awkward. And yet it's in the quiet that your spirit comes and puts his finger on those things in our life that needs to change. Father, once again, we confess our sins to you, that we are a people who stray so often We chased after so many things that we think will satisfy, even though we've tried it a hundred times, and yet, Father, it still comes up wanting. There is life in you alone. We ask you to forgive us our sins. Forgive us of our wayward hearts. Renew a right spirit within us. Draw us back to yourself. Humble us. Remind us of our desperate need for you. We thank you for your forgiveness. We thank you for what Jesus Christ did on our behalf by dying on the cross for paying for our sins that we might be restored 
to a new living relationship with you. Heavenly Father, we thank you. Jesus Christ, we thank you. Holy Spirit, we thank you that you continue to guide us. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. As we take communion, we're going to have our elders uh, standing here at these two aisles. We ask you, when a deacon lets you know, to go ahead and come forward, take the elements, move off to the side, take the elements, and you can put your cups in these bowls and then return back to your seats uh, this way. If you're here and you have uh, gluten issues, we have gluten-free stuff in the middle. And if you're unable to get up, uh, if you're unable to move at this time, just stay where you are, keep your hand raised, and uh, one of our men will come and serve you where you are. At this time, though, let's, let's take the Lord's communion.
stand at this time.
have a need for prayer, our elders will be down front here and we'd be happy to pray with you. Let me remind you, what is our application today? What, what do we take away from all this? Well, a few things. Difficult times should drive us back to God's Word for more understanding. Secondly, God values our true repentance. He values our honesty about our sin. And then finally, God is with us in our distress and in our disobedience. I did a, uh, a search. I have a fancy Bible program where I can search for phrases, and I search for the phrase, I am with you. Do you know how many times in the biblical record God says that to us? 14,356 times. And if you divide 356 days into that, do you know how many years of verses God can give you? One verse a day that reminds you, I am with you. Over 40 years of time. I heard it said years ago, when God says something, it's important. When he says it twice, he means it. When he says it three times, you had better obey it. But when he says it 14,356 times, he means it. So this is God's good word for you today. From Isaiah 41, Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Go in that grace. Have a great week.